Welcome to another TechSoup Connect event. Let's get into the heart of today's event. So what we're going to talk about today is how we can explore and improve the current philanthropic environment. Jeff says that the current fundraising system is broken, costly, and unfair, and he's prompting this initiative to improve it by creating a universal charity proposal. Jeff is the CEO of Axe for Water, one of Canada's oldest water charities, and the CEO and founder of WellFunded.io. Prior to these roles, he held senior leadership in technology companies and at a law firm that serviced the charitable sector, and he's worked extensively as a fundraising consultant. With that, I'm going to pass the mic over to my pal, Jeff Goldby. Thank you so much, Eli. I feel a while since I've been a part of Net Squared back when it was Net Tuesday. And I love this community. It has been a while since, yeah, we met in Gatstown there in real life, well before the days of Zoom and online meetup. But I am a big fan of this group and I am a big fan of the community that Eli has built over many years. It, it feels like a real privilege to be back. And I was reflecting on it last night to sit at the old head call. I was reflecting on it last night and on the community that I know it's more than just Eli, but on the community that so many have built over the many years. And just feeling like that's really cool how many people have poured into this. I'm approaching this topic and this group with a lot of openness and hopefully you'll hear humility and a desire to build a big tent here and most importantly, something that works. Uh, and build a bit better and more stronger property. I am just going to find, I need to pause because I can't multitask here. There we go. My window, share my screen before we get into it. So there's me. I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on other social channels, but they're probably not that interesting for you. And I'm joining you here from Deepson, which is traditionally that Musqueam territory, kind of the language of the Hakamina people group. So I have a short talk today. I'm going to present some data from over a hundred uh, conversations with philanthropists of all shapes and sizes, but well over a hundred conversations with various charity leaders, uh, fundraisers, executives, all different black charity as well, and put forward some ideas that myself, along with a group of philanthropists, charity leaders, and technology leaders are working on and invite some feedback, invite some conversation on that collaborative process and see where the conversation leads to fortune with the open. I'm on the run. There we go. Let me see if that'll last me the top for it. Okay. So quick rundown of the plan for today. I like a roadmap. Here's the roadmap. I'll give you a really quick background on myself, the origin story of how this problem got started and why it kept niggling at me. A little bit of the problem, the heart problem, I think, the process that came, that we embarked on the discovery, the thesis, and we'll dig into some conversation. Now, the problem, there's probably more eloquent ways of phrasing this, but in my opinion, so much of the fundraising machine is broken, particularly when it comes to major philanthropy. At a time when we're most dependent on it, the system, I believe, is the most inequitable, inefficient, and ineffective. Maybe a quick background on myself. I work in technology back really early days. I was working alongside a small technology startup that was doing payment processing for charity. So this was before things like Stripe existed and before even Canada Helps that just had a button that could take you to a Canada Help page. That was pretty early days of that. And so we were building some of sort of like an API that integrated with some payment processors. And all of that, I started to get into fundraising for causes that I cared about, but really just doing that as a one-off. And then I went and worked for another fundraising, or sorry, a technology company. And then eventually wound myself up at a law firm that was engaged in major five. So they were doing about a hundred million dollars a year in large philanthropic giving. These are things like wills, estates, bequests. And generally speaking, these were major donors that were coming to them to structure these gifts. So it gave a little bit of a distorted view of philanthropy and it certainly distorted my perception. Of now, when you have every day people coming in with money asking you to just help structure those deals you know, for tax efficiency and asking you to help facilitate giving money. Uh, after about eight years with that, with those organizations, I was just foolish enough, I like to say, to think, how hard could it be? I'll go work for a charity itself. And so I left the, the state world of technology and a law firm and went to work for a small nonprofit called Act to Water, which is where I'm at 
most of the time now. And I learned it's a lot harder raising money for a charity when you're on quote unquote, the other side of the table. And I learned there is indeed another side of the table that a lot of people didn't start returning my call when I started to work for a charity than when I was working at a, at a law firm. So I struggled, struggled with a lot of self-doubt, struggled with a lot of internal narrative about imposter syndrome. I struggled with a lot of, yeah, a lot of that the natural, um, natural confusion that comes when you're on the one side of the table, banging at the door, hoping that donors will return your call. And I was really grateful to work with alongside an executive coach to kind of help navigate those early days, leaving the world of major philanthropy from one side of the table and going on to the other side of the table, so on. And then COVID happened. And as many people who worked in the philanthropy sector learned, a lot of the things that were pre-COVID started to no longer work during COVID. Things like galas, things like in-person coffees with major donors. All of the relationship skills that I had normally built up. Nobody wanted to meet. Nobody wanted to attend a small wine and cheese night. Nobody wanted to go to an open charcuterie table and so on and so forth. And I struggled a lot with that. So we went along with the grant application process. We started to get a lot of rejections of grant applications. One day, I, after getting probably my 10th grant application rejection in that day, I ended up sending a frustrated response back to the foundation to a gentleman named Peter. He's fine with me using his name. And I ended up ranting at him and I said, we've wasted all of this time filling out your grant application for the last three years in a row. We meet your criteria perfectly. I don't even know what it is you want. I don't know how we could be a better charity. We're a perfect fit for you, so on and so forth. And uh, Peter ended up being incredibly gracious with me. And uh, let's jump on it. And from there, Peter and I started to talk and I opened rather aggressively with Peter. You always talk about charities wanting to collaborate. Why don't you collaborate with, and I started to list off all of these other foundations. And, uh, Peter, an older gentleman had been in the philanthropic space uh, for quite a long time, was very generous and very gracious with me and, uh, help a, the side of the table or help reveal some of the, the frustrations and challenges they go as a foundation, giving away large amounts of money. I, however, on my side, I also had some very valid frustrations that I could help share with him. Through many Zoom calls with Peter, we began a little bit of a friendship and a little bit of a conversation around going, ah, these two worlds both are engaged in the same sorts of activities. We both want to see good happen, but we so rarely talk. So the problem, as Peter and I got to talking, as these, this friendship started to blossom, to use some romantic language around it, Peter ended up spearheading a series of initiatives where he gathered his philanthropic friends and they hosted a series of roundtables where they started to talk about the challenges of giving money away and then invited charities to come in and share the challenges of receiving money, of applying for grants, of working with foundations, of working with philanthropists. And it ended up being this really beautiful, these were all via Zoom, so it was all during COVID. They ended up being these really beautiful evenings hosted by Peter or by other philanthropists or by other charity leader. And seeing some really interesting, not just data, but rich stories, hurtful stories, powerful stories, stories that are somewhere in between. I'm shifting off, but we'll get back to the problem. After all of these resumed, we had about eight of them these evenings and they were facilitated by these philanthropists, but also we had a moderator in there. No, summarize some of the problems. This, this is a problem that I came away with. And certainly the data, actually the data backs us up onto the, I'm going to get back to my script here, onto the inefficiency. It cost charities about $50 billion in direct costs just from fundraising from major donors and philanthropists. These are things like gala, these are things like applying for grants. So charities on average send out a minimum of 100,000 cold applications to foundations every single day. Cost of a philanthropist, it costs philanthropists, sorry, about $20 billion every single year just to manage that side of the table as well. So load a net of about $70 billion. So it's a very inefficient system. It's also a very inequitable system. Only about 4% of foundation dollars go to BIPOC or minority led charities. We know that about 70% of charities in the U S at least are run by white red leaders. And we know that the median revenue, we know that tends to actually serve charities better because the median revenue 
uh, of charities run by white, those who identify as white, tends to be about 54% higher than those charities that are run by minority led individuals. The stats get a lot more depressing when you even get further down to minority led charities serving minority led groups and so on and so forth. We also know that foundation dollars tend to reward fundraising ability over impact. So the larger charities are growing by about 20% year over year, where the smaller charities are shrinking by the same percentage uh, year over year. And when you're working particularly in smaller communities, we've seen uh, studies that show that the efficacy of larger charities to work, certainly when it comes to some communities and some impact areas is lower than uh, the efficacy of uh, smaller charities as well. So the impact and fundraising ability isn't always correlate, correlated. And if the system was working, I would be less critical, but it's also ineffective. Trust in charities by philanthropists is at a record level. One in five only these days, about 20% trusting charities to do what they say they'll do with their dollar. Primary driver is a lack of clear understanding as to what the impact would be with their dollar. Major donors are dropping out at a higher level than any other segment of donors. So we're spending more on fundraising, but fewer major donors than ever are getting. It's a problem. So the process, as I mentioned earlier, I interviewed and gathered data from over a hundred plus, over a hundred charities. And I've already illuminated, highlighted a little bit of what I learned. I learned that philanthropists are really good, caring, kind people. They, by and large, care deeply about the impact that they want to create in the world. These are people who have sacrificed a lot, that they're giving a lot of money away, and that they, these are really honest and sincere and good people. And I think it's a really important place to start. So too are the leaders of charity, also by and large. I mean that tongue in cheek, in case you can't pick up on my sarcasm. Almost all of us want the same thing, although for different reasons sometimes, which is a little bit different than most other capital markets. So if you look at, say, a lot of the financial markets, the supply and the demand sometimes want different things. But in the charity sector, almost all of us are working towards the same end. And yet this market is incredibly inefficient, ineffective, and inequitable. The results, we gathered a ton of data, and I'm not going to spew all the data at you. I do want to have some time for conversation, Q&A, and most importantly, hopefully workshopping. But I thought I would, I had ChatGPT summarize some of the key themes, and I've been giving these kind of talks to both philanthropists and charity leaders of all shapes and sizes across North America. And I thought I would summarize and put forward some of these key themes from the roundtables and surveys and one-on-one -on -one conversations. So these are the, some of the key themes from philanthropists. And I know there's a lot of text on the screen. I'll highlight a few of them. And yeah, I'll just highlight a few of them and then I can send this out. I think I can set this up, which we can debate later. Some of the key themes from the data that we pulled. Difficulty in finding qualified charities. A lot of LOIs are expensive, both charities and philanthropists, and there's a lot of difficulty around that. Transactional feeling. A lot of donors struggle with feeling like ATM. Charities constantly requesting funds without building genuine relations. There's also this interest and tension where philanthropists aren't quite sure what kind of relationship they want with a charity. The workload and time commitment can be overwhelming. And what was really interesting is we heard a lot from both philanthropists and charities that they want these transformational connections, but the effort required can be overwhelming. And so there's this tension here of not quite understanding what kind of relationship each other wants from each other. And there's another slide on the next, there's another point on the next one that, that also highlights this interesting, almost contradiction that exists. Power dynamics. Donors sometimes use financial contributions for personal gains. So this was one that came up when charities were in the room with finance, with philanthropists. And I remember a few, which was the theme that came up in one of the round table. Overhead costs. So older philanthropists are more concerned with overhead costs than millennial philanthropists. And we, there, there were, we did a lot of interviews with younger sort of next gen major donors, and they are more concerned with impact collaboration challenges. So this was the core theme and a little bit of attention where sometimes fun. They really want to collaborate. Other times, why would they say they just want to <laughs> This is the, there was a point here, number two, where both sometimes philanthropists and charities, nonprofit fundraise, shy and introverted fundraisers and donors found the philanthropic space challenging. So there are donors, major donor philanthropists that who are naturally introverted that don't want to go out for coffee, don't want to go to the gala, that don't want to engage. And they found that challenging and conversely, nonprofit or similarly, 
executive directors who are introverted by nature and don't want to engage in that, but have something to offer in the philanthropic leadership space. And we saw these beautiful conversations where we're like, you don't like this? I don't like this. Well, I, can't. I would rather stay home. So that was really interesting. Duplication of effort. Tension arises when donors are asked to fund organizations perceived as duplicating the work of others. And don't, and charities pushed back and said, we also feel like uh, we're duplicating effort when we have to apply multiple times. So that was also related. So those are some of the core themes from philanthropists. We're going to, I would love to just, I'm either happy to pause here. I'm, I have my chat closed because otherwise it's super distracting for me. If I should pause here, let me know, Eli. Nope. You're all good. Keep going. And then I'm just going to go fly over some of the core themes from charity leaders. And then, and then we can, I can open this up. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. This was also, I went over that last bit on the, put a sweat smiley face because desire to permit. So this is from the philanthropic meetings, highlight two, two of these, the tension around authentic relationships and communication. So understanding what the nature of the relationship that both parties want to have was really, was she theme here and decision-making and understanding. So everybody seems to struggle with understanding the, how granting decisions were made, how funding decisions were made, longer term commitment, and all of the process around granting. Um, so there's a ton of data here, and we're going to dig into that near the end. And some of our kind of key takeaways, after I fly over the charity stuff. Charities, they had a lot to say. And in fairness, we asked charities a lot more questions in part because of my own network, but charities had a lot to say. We asked charities, we asked charities, in essence, if you would like to present yourselves to foundations or to philanthropists, what is it that you would like to, how would you like to put your best foot forward? What is it that you would like to say to foundation leaders? What is it that you would like to say to philanthropists in order to be evaluated, in order to be reviewed, in order to yeah, be reviewed or, or ranked or, or have a dis funding decision made? And there was, we broke that question down and, and split it up seven ways Sunday. But here are some of the core themes. And uh, it was fascinating. Spoiler alert, they're almost opposite uh, from how foundations and philanthropists are, are currently asking, but we'll get to that in a second. Strategy for sale, for scale. Charities wanted philanthropists to ask about their strategy for scaling impact, efficiency and ROI. Charities want to reframe their, the efficiency and ROI uh, conversation. Feasibility for time frame and impact. Charities want philanthropists to understand what reasonable time frames look like they want to also showcase we saw so much pride from charity they want to showcase why they are uniquely positioned to get the job done and similarly why their work is uniquely important so much pride in a good way in the work that they're doing achievements and impact operational soundness and leadership and team expertise charities were so proud of the staff that they have and the spirit that they Charities had a lot to say. And then as if we weren't exhausted enough, we reviewed well over 50 grant applications. It was far more than that. The number that I quickly that's me. after reviewing 50 plus grant applications. Well, and this is where the great divide comes in. We looked at all of the things that philanthropists are struggling with, all of the things that charities say, this is how we want to present ourselves to the world and the tensions that exist there the tensions that exist there, and then the current process. And, and we have this, we have the soup, the tech soup, but we have this soup, we have this mix and this great divide that we are sitting with right now. And I think in the fundraising landscape, we have professional fundraisers, we have charity executives, we have grant writers, we have philanthropic advisors who charity or sort of donors essentially would hire to make giving decisions. But we don't necessarily have a seamless way to bridge those two worlds. One of the challenges that I am good friends with well, many philanthropic advisors, one of the challenges with philanthropic advisors is in the same way that I don't go to a bank for investment decisions because I bank exclusively online and the bank doesn't have a brick and mortar thing. I'm not going to find a philanthropic advisor if I'm a millennial ultra high net worth individual. There's no way to bridge the two worlds. It's the great divide that would, that has been created. However, we believe that 
as one head of a very large foundation said, one of the largest in Canada. All of this stuff around fundraising and philanthropy has been created by us and all of it can be uncreated. We believe that it can get better. We believe that we, all of us, can work together, build a better, more collaborative, more productive, more equitable, philanthropic space. One of our working theories is that we can do this by building a marketplace, by building a more equitable, more efficient, more effective marketplace. Marketplaces have been bringing worlds together since about 500 BC. They've been doing this by centralizing, standardizing, and coordinating supply and demand. They're not perfect, but they're a start. They're a middle ground. They standardize, centralize, and coordinate. And they can open up tremendous opportunity as well as reduce tremendous burdens. So to, to take uh, an optimistic approach and to take an optimistic mindset, if we understand that philanthropists uh, are just like us and want to do good and want to find good opportunity, if if I want to find, say, water projects in South Africa and I maybe my friend is involved in a water charity and I want to see, rather than open up a, a grant application and have all of the water charities create and send me individualized, because this is one of the things that we heard quite commonly, individualized, you know, 300 or 250, as I just got a rejection letter today for the 250 applications that cost me as a charity three hours to fill out only to get rejected. If we can standardize, centralize, and streamline this process on one open marketplace between philanthropists and charities, we can allow both subject matter expertise, we can allow the reduction of a lot of this tension, a lot of this friction to hopefully be reduced through creating a marketplace of sorts. So if we can agree that there's a problem and, and that's the big F and the current system of major donor philanthropy is in, 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 in inefficient and inequitable, and inequitable. And if we can agree that people are good and want to do well, I think the question is what kind of marketplace, what kind of solution could we build um, that would help improve it? Or is the marketplace even a productive approach? So I'll share a little bit more about where we're going with this before we and poke into some specific questions. But I'd love to just pause now because I've thrown way just a ton of data at the wall. And I'm cognizant of that, even though I can't see the chat. And I would love to just open it up just on the data and the conversations approach and anything that's percolating in your mind so far. Yeah. Anything that's percolating in your mind so far. And if not, I'll keep going with a few more prompts. Hey friends, if you've got any questions, feel free to throw it in the chat or even get brave and jump off mic. Yeah. Hi, it's Hayden here from uh, BMV. Just what's I'm seeing what you're painting a picture here is trying to match like match charity to philanthropist, right? And there, if you're given any consideration, there's where there's poor match, but right. Or a, if I mean, they had this element or how can I put it? Three, three charities match with two philanthropists to unlock what they need. There's kind of a, a one-to-one, there's a many-to-one, one-to-many, and maybe an, an enabling tool or something. There's a, is that something that you've considered or is it just more of a one-to-one? Mm -hmm. Great question. And I'd love to answer both the comments also just popped into the, uh, chat too. Our hope is to not necessarily play match make, but to create a, let me just, every time I click off, but to create a, let me see if I can have, I don't, oh, yeah, I've just totally navigated off. Create a portrait of sorts. And we're, this is, these are just bad wire for, we're in that, so there is a real thing being built here. Can share our local server. Um, create a common profile, a common approach that would then allow philanthropists to find matches based on their unique giving preferences. And then in the example of, let's say, ACT, the, the clean water charity that I work for, we just 30 minutes before this presentation, we, I just got a rejection letter from a, a grant from a, actually a corporate funder and their response was, but didn't, didn't reflect you. We just had 250 applications. We gave it to another entrepreneur. We, we run an entrepreneurship program in Southwest Yukon. We gave it to another entrepreneurship program, blah, 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 blah. And my instinct was you didn't actually ask for any M and E data. 
And, and, and I'm not being critical at all, but if you could imagine as a funder, me going in and going click now, and I send it to subject matter expert, them give a independent analysis of where the higher performing or, or send this on to a philanthropic advisor, or if I was a philanthropic advisor, I you on the client, the water charities or the cancer charities or the animal charities, but that we well-funded are not the, the, the gatekeepers or the, the authority. And then to the comment of relationship building being known, I agree. I don't think this is a shortcut for trust or this isn't a replacement for looking somebody in the eye because I think that's where it comes. But I think the, the qu real question is if we know that, I know that being a white male drastically benefits me in the fundraising space, overwhelming because we get people who look like us and we give to people, we, we get to people we know. And I know that the next world changer is working on some solution we've never heard of in some corner of the world that can't even pronounce, but they're kept out of the arena because they don't know rich people and they can't write a grant application. And I think if I was an innovative high net worth individual, I would want to be able to find them, review their financials, review the solution they're working on, and then jump on a Zoom call and be, tell me about that. Tell me about your thesis for changing the world. And can I get behind that and look them in the eye? But I don't think it's, but I don't think it replaces the relationship, but I don't think it replaces the chance to build connection. I just think right now it's really tough to, it, I'm just aware of the fact that I'm really good with the majority of white men who have a lot of the high net worth in Canada, not to be too cheeky, but I have some other questions, but I'll be happy to, yeah. Hi. I don't see if anybody else uh, have their hands because I just see myself. So I don't know if this is uh, really a question or more of an observation. And the, someone here, Robert, mentioned in the chat that it all starts with building relationships as it being known. It's not that easy to actually build relationships because most of the foundations, uh, particularly the big ones, have the applications only on online. And we don't even know who is behind this, as I said from this says on, on, on the website. When I say we don't know who is behind the person, it's not Jeff or Mark or whoever, right? Yeah. And uh, it's very rarely that you have a local connection. And there are foundations that belong to the corporations. That's another story, but there's also the private foundations that you actually never. And then actually, they even have a disclaimer very often on their website. Don't call, don't, it's all automa automatically, you just put this online. So how do you form a relationship when there's no, when there's no person? One thing, the other observation is that Jeff, you mentioned in, as the result of all these conversations that actually the, and I work in the arts. For us, it's even harder. It's more ephemeral to explain the, the impact, the benefit. And we go and we try, we say, okay, this many people, this many audiences, this many, that it, it, it's a little bit easier. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's a little bit easier when you have the clean water, the, this, how many school, sure. people, this is how many uh, animals we say, all this for us. Mm -hmm. And when foundations look at us, they probably look at the, at the lump sum and there's so many, last time I checked, there were about 73 registered theaters in, in Vancouver. So how do you distinguish? That you know, somebody brings the, anyways, all our visions and what we do are, are very similar. And then for foundations, this is probably just a lot of something said arts. Gee. So how do we go into the longer process when you say, okay, here's the real impact that it's more descriptive right. rather than just the financial. So more comments than, than questions. So. And I'd love to just, and I, I don't want to hog anything, but I'd love to connect with you to hear what kind of question you'd like to be asked in order to represent yourself well. Do you know what I mean? So in order to be represented well to a philanthropist, what would you like to be asked? I think or is the, is the million dollar question. Sorry, what I'm not I would like to ask them or what I would like them to ask on my own. Uh, correct. The latter. Yeah. Yeah. I have to think about it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I, I don't, we don't need that better right now, but I'm pretty here. Can I comment on, on her feedback regarding my comment? Yeah. Well, what I really meant was what, what I find is it's not necessarily making contact with the foundation. 
it's making contact with many people who may have a relationship with the foundation. For example, in, in past lives, I've worked with people who work for Heinz Corporation. So if I'm looking for a grant from the Heinz Corporation, I'm talking to people who worked for Heinz who know people internally. And obviously building a trust with those people. So if they're speaking on our behalf, my behalf, whatever the organization behalf, they can say, this organization does good work. They're well-respected in their community. They're known by their local leadership. They publish their annual reports and their 990. Things that, that allow, that not, it's not just then a feeling, it's the fact that there's information that's out there that, that can validate that what they're saying is probably true. Not just personally, any success that we've had where I've had in my career is because I reached out to somebody who may have had, who may reached out to somebody else, who may reached out to somebody else. Now, I'm not saying building those relationships is easy. It isn't. And sometimes you have to go that extra mile. But I, I find that's at the heart of making anything happen anymore is just being known, being trusted, being transparent, the, and other things, but those types of attributes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we've got a great clarifying question coming in from Janet in the chat who wants to get a sense of, is what you're ultimately envisioning here the Exeified, Kickstarterified, eBayified, like this marketplace version where we take the foundations, the donors that I fund, all these people, these brokers into one place where they can sort of review the many projects out there and identify what's the best fit based on their own criteria. Is that sort of what's happening there? Sure. Great question. And I don't, I'm waffling between not necessarily giving a full pitch because I'm not really here to sell more just to invite conversation and more ask back what would help. What do you think would help improve the, if we can agree on the problem, what would help improve the, build a better solution, but the model that, so community foundations are a great one or, or DAFs are a great one, right? I, I used to work for a DAF, but everyone was going, how do I get money from a DAF? And I said, $500 billion question. Um, and some DAFs have their own grant application process. Some DAF fund holders that a DAF have no grant application process and Effectively, what we're trying to build are tools for philanthropists. You could imagine like realtor.com, a great example. You list your house on realtor.com uh, because building my own website, when I want to sell my house with all of the own information on it, with unstandardized data, and then going around and trying to fet find my own seller based on relationships, somebody I know it, blah, 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 would neither guarantee me the best outcome and it would be incredibly expensive nor guarantee me the but just like realtor.com, I can list my house, but I also work with realtors, aka fundraisers or philanthropic advisors. Um, so it's not quite Etsy or GoFundMe in that we're not looking for crowdfunding and it's not a transaction platform. And then you're not giving through, we're not giving through this platform, just the buying a house on realtor.com. One, one philanthropist is also a partner and funder of ours, but also going to be a user related. And I don't think this is going to be our go-to-market pitch strategy hinder for philanthropists, but on the back end, they, they get tools as a philanthropist to manage their giving. So if they find a project with that and they like it, they can build a wish list. They can build a giving list. They can manage the reporting relationship. Um, and, and they can track what projects they've pledged to on the back end. It like Benevity in, in some ways, again, we're not transacting through it or building a, and Benevity is a good partner of ours because. The problem with Benevity, again, is it's a separate siloed grant application that I have to find and fund and everything else. And so it's and it, for corporation, right? Where this would be essentially a common grant application for foundation, philanthropist, individual philanthropist, and anybody to be able to search, view, find, and then the philanthropists have tools on the back end to manage their giving. Whether you're just giving just, I use that name quote, just giving, it, it's not necessarily built for somebody who giving smaller amounts of money, but yeah, that's the solution we're proposing to build, but I'm looking for in, in some way, or, and we are working toward, but the, the question is worth the solution. Are you guys experiencing the pain that I'm experiencing as a charity leader, putting all the time and effort into 
tried to fundraise from major donors and philanthropists and foundations. We know the philanthropists are experiencing this. And how do we build a solution that works toward the more equitable, efficient, and uh, effective charitable? This is what we're working toward. I've got a hand up here from um, Adrien, who, sorry about that, I didn't, this is a new feature to me, I didn't even know what was going on over there. Please come off mic, but thank you for your patience. I'm a tech geek, but interesting setup. But okay, I have a couple questions because as Jeff was talking about nonprofits, what I have every demographic on the planet, mom, okay. grand program, a woman, person of color, blah, blah, yeah. blah. As a person who is doing the community work out there in the field, out there talking to clients, even a larger organization, major large organizations who, who, are, who are not necessarily really helping, I feel, families. Uh, mm. And they reach out to us and say, hey, can you help us? I'm like, you have billions of dollars. You just got, why are you calling us? My issue is how do, when people are talking about DEI in, in the States, and then they say, oh, we want to help more women-led, more minority who are sure. really out there feeding families and that kind of stuff. But then it's like these blocks of, you have to have a million to five million dollars in the two years in a row. And most Community nonprofits, for example, are zero to what, 500K? So, yeah. blocks that I feel like, oh, they, you want to do more for the community and people who are out in the community, who've been part of the community, understand those. We are a peer organization as a small nonprofit and mental health. And I'm just, I get so frustrated because I have 11 jobs. Yeah. And trying to do another grant sometimes. I missed two grants that I was trying to get to, but I was focused on some financial stuff that we had to work on and, and the annual report and everything like that. How do we do it all and mm -hmm. also have the technology? I'm a tech geek, so I'm I'm better than most. There's people in the field that who are executive directors who really just want to do do good and they have no tech skills. And how are we gonna do all of this? and do the work and feed families or do all the things that we do when it's so many roadblocks. That's just my Yeah. Yeah, that was a good thought. My, I mean, I don't feel adequate to really respond only to say, I mean, my wife has, works for a similar in the sort of small downtown East side, not small, but and I act as we got two full time here in Canada. And similarly, we have large, large charity water, want the fun. Oh, you got to be over blank. Give me a million bucks. I'll be over it. So I get that struggle. And this is part of that attempt is we spend last year, a huge amount of money on hiring a grant writer for the first time. And it didn't return anything. And it's not the grant writer's fault. It was just a roll of the day. We made a bad, bad. Now, and anyways, I don't really have, these are good problems. And these are the things that we're trying to work towards. And can we filter toward, this is the education piece of going, okay. So as a funder, do philanthropists want to fund s smaller charities? And can we highlight, this is my point of going, large nonprofits are growing by 20%. Small ones are shrinking by 20%. We know that, that doesn't correlate to impact necessarily because we've seen other points that, that actually show certainly in minority, but in smaller, certainly areas of impact, smaller charities actually deliver higher impact. It's not always the case universally, but sometimes it is for a lot. Can we, we don't, we, we need to figure out a wedge point to start. And, and I too miss grants all the time. Just me and a program person. I hear you. And I think that's a really good point. And I would be remiss if I just tried to offer a pithy solution other than to go like, that is the key motivating factor. Because we too don't have a full-time grant writer. And I would love to continue that conversation. Like, no. Yeah. If you're open to dropping your email, either in chat or I can follow up in some way, that'd be awesome. Jeff, you've done yeah. these rounds of conversation. You've got this idea about what could address some of these challenges. Where do, where does it go? What's your next steps along this process? Yeah, thank you so much for teeing that up, UI. I really appreciate it. We've been doing these conversations across North America via Zoom. 
and some improvement now. Um, meanwhile, we've been building, building this product, so to speak, and, but we're not at this part by 20 years. And we're not at the design, this portion, because these conversations are the crucial part. And the heart of the problem really is, can we agree that this is, this is a problem this granting, this philanthropic space, this major donor space is a problem. And if so, really my next step, my question, take away from this group, people are open to emailing me after continuing on in the conversation after I've got two questions on my screen and maybe I can drop them into the, the chat or I'll just put them up here. One, what bridge would we have to build pain? Would we have to take away in order for you be, to be willing to join us on this adventure? So I like to look at things, or I'm forcing my to look at things from an optimistic perspective. And I believe that we can build something here together that could work and, and reimagine a more equitable, efficient, and effective philanthropic space. To frame it like that, what pain would we have to take away or bridge would we have to build for you to join us on this adventure? And then really specifically, you guys know your sector. You guys know the cause of the charity that you work for. The question that I would like question that I would like you to consider and feed to me, if you're so willing, is what, how would you like your charity or sector cause represented or reflected well on this, we're calling it a portrait, but on this charity portrait, we're not going to get a perp. It's going to be an iterative process. We're about, we're bridging this divide, but those are the two, two, two words. So how would you like your cause sector? charity reflected well on this portrait and what pain would we have to take away or bridge would we have to build for you to join us on this adventure y'all are busy people i so appreciate this i, I don't take the time for granted and appreciate the opportunity